All right, welcome everyone to the Hilt Lunch and Learn Healthcare Apprenticeship Consortium. Uh, we are really excited for the information that's coming real soon. Uh, just a few housekeeping. Uh, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself into the group chat, that'd be appreciated. Just say a quick hello and include your name and organization. And uh, also, if you want to rename yourself, you can. In the upper right-hand corner of your picture box, you'll see three ellipses. Click on those, click rename, and you can use mine as an example. You see my name, my organization, and my pronouns. And without further ado, we're going to go ahead and welcome uh, everyone uh, to this meeting. And I'm going to do a few logistics as we talked about. Uh, remember to go to keep yourself on mute as well, uh, just so that doesn't cross over any communications as we're talking and recording. And then go ahead and use the chat functions freely, please be right ahead. Um, as you know, from the Hilt Purpose and Vision, we are a diverse network, uh, small and large healthcare providers in Seattle, King County, Snohomish, and Pierce. So we are expanding, uh, who come together and take action, improving access to a skilled healthcare workforce. Um, since its launch in 2018, we have just, we're coming up on four years real soon. Uh, we have been making improving equity and diversity in the region's healthcare workforce uh, and a set of guiding principles across all of our communities. So we are excited for that. All right, we want to welcome the Healthcare Apprenticeship Consortium, and I will hand it over to Laura. Welcome, Laura. Hello, thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for the little dance, Ryan. I know a lot of you in this room, but there are definitely some folks I don't know. So <clears throat> I, I, for those of you who don't know me, I just encourage you to engage with me in this conversation. Hopefully I'm, I get, I'm very excited about the work that we do and so I can get talking and I'm, but I would love to have interactivity. So feel free to jump in. You can talk over me. You can put your hand up. You can use chat, whatever. I'm, I'm okay with whatever that looks like. So super happy to have you all here today to talk about our programming. I'm going to um, start off by talking a, a little bit about who our organization and who we are. So if you could, James, uh, change the, oh, that's the, that's the very, okay. that's okay. Uh, I think it went backwards instead of forwards. <clears throat> that's the uh, end. I'm going to stop sharing and just make okay. sure I'm, I'm sharing the right presentation. One second, please. Quite all right. So while that's happening. Let me go ahead and talk about um, our organization. So uh, I am the executive director of the SEIU 1199 Northwest Multi-Employer Training and Education Fund. Uh, it actually even has another title in there. You can see it's super long name, but everyone calls us the training fund or the healthcare training fund. That's, that's what we're known as. Um, easiest way to refer to us. And we work with, obviously, SEIU 1199 Northwest, uh, the union, and we also work with the largest healthcare systems in Washington state, including Swedish, Multicare, Kaiser, uh, CHI Franciscan System, University of Washington, um, did I, already say, I think I already said Multicare. Anyway, all the large healthcare systems in the state, uh, and basically, we as an organization historically, so this organization has been around for about 12 years now. And what we do in a nutshell, I'm just, so most organizations in the acute care healthcare setting, they have some sort of employee education plan where they will maybe reimburse people for going to school uh, as long as they're continuing in healthcare or something like that. What's different and unique about us is that we, instead of each of those hospitals putting their money into their own buckets, they put it into a common bucket and we're responsible for that bucket of money. Uh, and we are able to work with these healthcare because most of them have very common similar needs. We're able to produce one programming and serve all of them rather than each of them trying to figure it out on their own. Um, there's a whole lot more that we do, but that's in a nutshell. Um, <clears throat> about four years ago though, uh, the board, which is made up of half of uh, all those employer leaders from those employers that I just mentioned, as well as uh, the union, uh, came to a decision that it wasn't enough for the training fund to just to be supporting only incumbent workers, people who are already in the work. They wanted to see a transition to actually having helping people get into healthcare because that was they saw that coming down the line, uh, and so and they wanted us to start with apprenticeship programs. 
And thus we created the Healthcare Apprenticeship Consortium, which is what we're, we're here today to talk about. So the training fund sponsors the healthcare apprenticeship and administers the Healthcare Apprenticeship Consortium. You can see us, uh, HCAC is uh, also um, how you'll hear us referred to. So a lot of the same employers who sit on our training fund board, sit on the Healthcare Apprenticeship Consortium board, uh, although we are, uh, we were the first in the nation multi-union and multi-employer training fund program. So in addition to SEIU, there's also OPEIU and UFCW. Uh, all these folks from industry coming together to say, hey, we've got to, we're all in trouble if we don't resolve this issue. Let's work together and try to figure out how to make this better. And thus came um, the Healthcare Apprenticeship Consortium. We started with other occupations, medical assisting, central cell processing, pharmacy tech, when everybody said, pause, stop everything, focus on behavioral health. That is our largest need right now in the state. We really need to shift gears. And so <clears throat> we did. We actually uh, went about and uh, brought together a whole bunch of employers, behavioral health employers from around the state to try to figure out, do you need apprenticeship? And if so, what would that look like? We had the largest group of stakeholders I've ever had involved in conversations. We had over 40 uh, uh, industry representatives participating in those stakeholder meetings. It was super exciting to see folks really engaged in trying to build something. And we were able then to uh, get grant funding to support. We have a lot of grant funding for this particular project. Um, including from the uh, state labor and industries, as well as a partnership between the Balmer Group and University of Washington. Uh, and uh, the Behavioral Health Institute uh, is our key partner in this project. So I just want to say the last piece before we jump into the details of the programs, that <clears throat> when we first started this work and, and we decided to get into behavioral health, we are, I, apprenticeship is in my blood. It's what I know how to, I, apprenticeship is something I'm really, really good at, and I have a lot of expertise in, but I don't in behavioral health. So we actually, through all these magical things that aligned, ended up partnering with the Behavioral Health Institute, uh, and they have been a phenomenal partner, and they bring the behavioral health expertise to the table, and if they don't have it, they find the people to bring to the table. Um, so it's been a really strong partnership between the Behavioral Health Institute and us, and I also want to mention King County um, has played a critical role in this work, um, both from actually assigning us a staff person to help with project management, um, all the way to now they are um, they have agreed to give us a substantial amount of funding to continue this endeavor as well. So that's the outset. I'm gonna any questions before we get into the details about who we are, how we came to be, any of those first pieces. Okay, James. Oh, there's a question, Susie. Hey, Hi. Uh, Behavioral Health Institute, is that part of the University of Washington? Is that the full name? Yes, so it is part of University of Washington. And I see Cheryl who is here from the Behavioral Institute is here. So I'm gonna ask her to just, Cheryl, will you step in real quick? You're on mute, by the way. Yes, uh, sorry about that. Um, uh, yes, we are part of, uh, we're part of UW Medicine and we're housed at Harborview. So we, are most closely affiliated with Harborview. We say we're the Harborview of Behavioral Health Institute. And we have um, three arms and the arm of the Behavioral Health Institute that's working with Laura and team. Laura et al. is called the Training Workforce and Policy Innovation Center. Any other questions about BHI? Excellent. Thanks, Cheryl. Thanks for jumping in there. Okay, so apprenticeship. There is a lot of data as to why an employer would want to get it. Well, let me back up. There's pretty obvious reasons why somebody would want to become an apprentice. Um, instead of uh, going to school full time and paying tuition and not having income coming in while they're going to school, it is an opportunity. The, the common phrase is earn while you learn. And they have an opportunity to go to, to being paid while they're learning on the job. And that's a super, super exciting prospect for folks. And I'll just say that is one of the major reasons that apprenticeship has the opportunity to bring in diverse groups of people into the field that otherwise it might be a challenge to get in. It's not just diverse people, but it's anybody who has barriers to going the traditional route, whether that traditional route going through a college program can be anything from financial barriers 
to, you know, you have so many things happening in your life with your family and whatnot, those kinds of barriers, all the way to actually just the, your learning style barrier. Um, because apprenticeship does provide an opportunity to learn in a very hands-on way rather than learning from just from sitting in a classroom and learning just from theoretical concepts. So it really shifts the game in terms of who can get into apprenticeship. That being said, there are a lot of benefits for an employer to participate. This is the number one question I get asked when it comes to apprenticeship. They, you know, I can't afford it. It takes too much time. Uh, how, am I, how am I supposed to do that when I don't have enough? I'm already overworked. I, my staff is already dying on the vine. How, how am I supposed to bring on somebody else? These are the questions I get asked the most often around apprenticeship. And so the notion here, um, there's all sorts of research, research that shows that there's a significant return on investment for employers participating in apprenticeship. There's, nobody can question that because there's been so much actual research done on this, on this concept. Um, but in reality and practicality, when you're thinking about starting it out, you might have some questions around that. So the three things that we have listed on this slide are really important to keep in mind. Um, I'll say financially, in the financial uh, element of the return on investment for apprenticeship, it really comes down to the increasing of retention. So absolutely significant, your retention will increase, no question, and your recruitment efforts can decline because you have a higher increase. So that those two pieces together and the speed at with which somebody becomes capable it's really shocking. I think most people are surprised when they actually dig into the apprenticeship data and they see how quickly an apprentice is actually able to take up some of the work and begin to do the work. And if you hire someone directly from a college program, you still have time that you're training that person's process, that person in your processes and procedures. There's already time that you have to set aside to do training regardless. There is a in this case. The thing that's different is that apprenticeship will provide you with a structured way to do that. The apprenticeship system that uh, we use and hopefully most people are using um, actually provides structured on the job training, not just a random, okay, you have a new person, you have to figure it out. So we'll talk about that as we get into this a little bit more. But all in all, it ultimately it will reduce your overtime uh, rates because you'll have more people in being able to get the work done. It absolutely will increase your quality. And this has to do with the piece around you're teaching them your processes, your way from day one, and they learn how you want them to learn. And they're not bringing old practices, different ideas and concepts with them as they're coming in the door. Um, I, on the loyalty piece that's listed here, I want to mention a significant research that has also been done around the mentor who is assigned to work with that apprentice. There's significant research that their retention is also increased in addition to the apprentice. So there is, there's a multiple, the retention factor doesn't just go to the apprentice, it also goes to the mentor. And I already mentioned some elements around equity uh, and really having uh, programming that is available to anybody, anybody. It doesn't matter how much money they have that they can actually go to school and they can learn and get into the field. Any questions about why apprenticeship? Okay, James, next slide, please. Excellent. Now we're gonna get into the meat of the matter. How does the apprenticeship actually work? So I'm gonna talk about apprenticeships in general, and then we'll jump into the occupations, the behavioral health occupations, specifically the ones that we have. So let me, but let me start by talking about the general concept of apprenticeship and how it works. So there's two major components of apprenticeship. And one is the on-the-job training that I've already referred to, often referred to as OJT. It also can be called OJL, as you see here, or um, on-the-job learning. Uh, there's different people refer to it different ways. And in addition to that, there is classroom time, college credited classroom, that is a partnered with the on-the-job learning. And the concept here is that people are learning a lot of the work on the job but they're going to school to learn the theory behind why they're doing all that you know, when they're in school. Now, sometimes we actually don't just teach the why in school, we also teach how. I'll give you an example with medical assisting, for example, when we're teaching phlebotomy, we don't have people going out and poking people, taking their blood for the very first time uh, on a new patient. We actually are teaching the how also. So it really depends on the content. But in general, the concept is that they're practicing 
they're doing the work on the job and they're learning the theory behind it when they're going to school. That related supplemental instruction can include lab, not just actual uh, didactic conversation uh, learning. It can actually include lab time as well. So uh, when we talk about in the apprenticeship world, it's called RSI, the related supplemental instruction. And when we talk about RSI, we're talking about both classroom and lab. Uh, in the case of behavioral health, it's more classroom and less lab than in some of the other apprenticeship contexts. <clears throat> so how do we teach that classroom time? Uh, we actually, at the Healthcare Apprenticeship Consortium, even before COVID hit, had already tried to think about the fact that we wanted to be able to work with people anywhere in Washington state, and we wanted to be able to do it quickly and easily. And so we developed the concept of having uh, virtual classrooms, and we actually have setups. We have all the equipment where we can, enough for eight different locations that we can pick up and take anywhere and set up in a in, you know, within 30 minutes to an hour, have it all set up for a virtual classroom in any of these eight locations around the state. <clears throat> in reality, we haven't needed to use as many of those at this point um, because people, because COVID happened <laughs> and people got used to doing online learning in their own house. Uh, so that shifted some of that. And we were now, um, so our learning, our concept at the Healthcare Apprenticeship Consortium is that we don't do just online learning where, okay, here's your online class, go get it done, come back to me when you're done. Instead, we actually have live interactive time with an instructor. So that's one of the key things about the Healthcare Apprenticeship Consortium is that we do have this live time with where um, there's advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is you get to actually be right there with an instructor and ask questions and be engaged in that way. The disadvantage is that you do have to be there at an assigned time. I would say there is actually an advantage to that sometimes for apprentices, sometimes it's helpful for them to have, it's harder for people sometimes to manage their own time to do it just on their own. But for some people, they're great at that. And that makes sense in some situations as well. So it really, but the Healthcare Apprenticeship Consortium believes in this kind of interactivity where there's a live instructor available. We also have all the content put on a system called Ruby, which is our learning management system or LMS where we have all the materials and interactive uh, opportunity for the students to learn. They can be, they'll have Ruby up while they're engaging with the instructor and the instructor will say, okay, turn to this next slide. Now do this exercise and there will be interactive exercises in Ruby that they have to do. Uh, and so we have that kind of format for the, so we call it a hybrid because they are doing it virtually. However, there could be some in-person labs, for example, in the substance use disorder professional, um, our folks who are building it out are intending to have a few days of lab built into the, um, uh, into the classroom, into the curriculum. Now, I mentioned earlier about the structured on the job training. This is really, really critical because when you think about the educational, how people learn and so much of apprenticeship is based on the concept of learning their, uh, directly from their experience. But lots of times when you go into an organization and you say, hey, uh, can you, you know, build an on the job training program or can you train this person, they just assign somebody to work with them and they just say, okay, go, and they don't actually have a plan. But for the apprenticeship, for these programs, we actually have a plan. And what I mean by that is <clears throat> we have all of the competencies that have to be learned. Now, depending on which occupation, how we got to those competencies was a mix of those meetings I talked to you about earlier on where we had all these employers engaged, but also a lot of the regulatory requirements that exist. So taking all of those pieces together, we were able to come up with uh, all the competencies that have to be achieved for these occupations. And we make sure, you know, we identify those, there's a few that need to be learned just in the classroom. But majority of them actually are going to be at least touched on in the actual work, workplace. And, and a lot of them, a lot of time is spent there. So how this happens is, well, we have an app we call work, it's called Work Hands. And the app actually has all of the competencies listed in there that they have to achieve on the job. And what, so let's just say Tiana's going to, she's the apprentice, she's going to work. Uh, Tiana has to fill out her 
form. So she does, let's say in that week, she spends time doing, I'm totally making this up, but let's just say de-escalation. She actually has an experience working around de-escalation. She goes onto her app and, and in her app, it'll have the de-escalation section. And then it has a rating scale that rates like to what level do you, do. to what level do you think that you've achieved uh, competency around that? And she submits that it gets sent to the, uh, mentor who then looks at that and says, yep, Tiana did do this and it, yep, she's at this level. That automatically gets sent to the healthcare partnership consortium and we have to submit it all to labor and industries who essentially acts as our accrediting body uh, to make sure that everything is done as it should be done. And so we have to track all that data, but it all happens immediately upon Tiana going in and filling out her document saying what I've done. So at any given point, we can pull up a record and show what has Tiana accomplished and how far along is she in each of those competencies. The additional element that's built in and that we will support employers with at the very beginning is trying to identify how you're gonna have them achieve each of those competencies. So it's important that you know, oh, we're gonna have them do this kind of setup. We're gonna have them do this, blah, 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 whatever it is. and we. And we will have a, uh, we have a draft plan that then employers just need to adapt based on their work setting. Because every work setting is a little bit different. You need to be able to make your adjustments. But in general, it will give you the whole, here's, here's how all the competencies, here's an, here's an idea of how they could learn them. And then you can make the adjustments. And that building of that on-the-job training plan is an important component at the very beginning uh, to make sure that you have all that um, covered and that you have a structured plan. So the other piece of that structured plan is a mentor. So every apprentice needs to have a mentor. <clears throat> now, what uh, our standards and what Washington State has registered apprenticeship has allowed us to do is that for these behavioral health occupations, we're allowed to have two apprentices for every mentor, two apprentices for every mentor. So with that mentor, it's really important that you, so you as the employer, identify who that mentor will be, which is great, but not everybody who's necessarily good at their job necessarily is good at mentoring. Uh, so we actually have a free mentor training program that they're required to participate in because we want to make sure those mentors are set up for success. If I had to say out of all of apprenticeship things, the number one most important critical element to success of apprenticeship is the relationship between the apprentice and the mentor that will make or break it every single time. So you have to make sure that you've got good mentors identified and that we have a training program to support them uh, so that they know how to move forward. Any questions, that's a lot of information about how the apprenticeship works. Any questions about that? Hi, Susie. It's gonna be me again. Excellent. Um, how much time is taken out of the mentor's work time to support the apprentice? That is a great question. So Susie, we actually have data to show you on this that within, and oh, is Mark in the room by any chance? Mark is not. So Mark is our director of apprenticeship. I was hoping he was here because he has those numbers at the tip of his uh, finger, his tongue he always, oh, he is here. Mark, hello. Hello. Can you jump in and, cause I don't remember the exact numbers. I wanna make sure you know the exact number. Did you hear Susie's question? Uh, no, I didn't. I... So Susie was asking how much time will be taken off of the mentor. So can you talk about um, when an apprentice comes on, how it impacts the mentor, and then also the uh, how quickly an apprentice gets up to speed? The yeah, the, the, the rough numbers uh, from Providence and Spokane, actually a little bit of feedback from Swedish. For, this is medical assistance, Swedish in um, Seattle here, and then Kaiser is... Um, uh, is there's about a 20% impact on the mentor time during the first two months only, and then it goes away. And the apprentices are pretty much up to about 60% after three months. And then we typically find 80% uh, after six months or better. Uh, for medical assistance, their MAR is after six months and will have taken their national exam. Uh, some of the other exams in the other programs uh, come at slightly different times. Um, behavioral health, we think SUDP is a longer program, so it may be a little slower, um, but the others are one-year programs. 
Hopefully that helps. So Sarah, um, you put in chat that it will be important to know behavioral health specifically. Absolutely. We just don't, nobody's done this before for behavioral health. So we don't, there is no data that exists yet on this. So uh, it will be something that we will be tracking to try to figure out, but we don't expect it to be that different. I mean, we, so what Mark's referring to is actually a research study that was done by SJI here on the medical assistant programs in Washington state but it mirrors very closely to studies that have been done across all kinds of apprenticeship programs all across the nation in all sorts of different occupations. So we don't expect it to be very different because when this one came out, because healthcare also was new to uh, this kind of apprenticeship. And so we were happy to see that it actually mirrored what other, um, what they found with other apprenticeships across the country. So we're expecting that it will be similar, but we will absolutely be tracking that. Thank you, Sarah, for bringing that up. And Monica, Monica is right on cue as if I had paid her. She says, could you please detail the types of behavioral health career paths to which these apprenticeships apply? So James, will you change the slide, please? There we go. So let's talk about that, Monica. Um, so we have three different uh, behavioral health occupations that we're starting with that will all be starting this fall. So the first one is the behavioral health technician. The second one is peer counselor, and the third one is substance use disorder professional. I'll get into, I think on the next slide we have more details, but I want to point out here that these apprentices, can, anyone in Washington state can participate in these behavioral health programs as long as they meet, there are requirements that they have, there are standards that they have to meet in order to get in. So especially the substance use disorder profession, there are there is a basic English and math level assessment that they have to take. There is not that same assessment for peer or behavioral health technician, uh, but substance use definitely has that. Uh, and the other thing is, is that they have to be in proximity that they can go to work every day. So they have, they can't be somewhere entirely random. Their transportation, however they're going to get to work, that has to be lined up in order for them to be successful. And any healthcare, any any healthcare employer in Washington State can participate. Okay, will you go to the next slide, James? Actually, with this group, I think I'm going to not spend so much time on this slide because this slide gets into why behavioral health, but you wouldn't be here if you didn't already know that. So I'm not, I'm actually, I'm going to skip over this and go to the next one. So let's talk about these three occupations specifically. So um, the behavioral health technician, uh, sometimes I get the question, what is that exactly? And that is a very good question. When we met with those, all those employers, when we first kicked this project off, uh, everybody was able to describe a similar role, but they all had different titles. So we had to kind of land on a title. So we landed on behavioral health technician, uh, but essentially it's the assistant, it's sort of that entry level position assistant role. It can be inpatient, it can be outpatient, doesn't matter. Um, but it's uh, the person who supports perhaps a substance use disorder professional or some other, or maybe a career uh, family therapist person, but um, usually it's in the, in the um, it can be in a variety of settings actually. Um, but it's that we, the language that we often use is that it's our least trained employee working with the absolute most vulnerable population. And that's the behavioral health tech. And they come in a variety of names. And you, if you work in this field, you'll be able to identify who that is in your particular segment um, and knowing. And so what we're trying to do is provide those folks with actual structured training and a pathway. So the goal here is that all of these will ultimately feed into, so the behavioral health tech and the peer will feed into the substance use disorder. So if somebody wants to continue on and take the substance use disorder, they do not have to start from scratch. They will get credit for what they already know. And ultimately we are working with four-year colleges to get these accepted into baccalaureate degrees so that they can continue on and even go get their master's. So that's our, that's, we are in the process of working right now with a couple different universities to make that, to pull that piece together. And of course, we're working with community colleges to get the college credit attached to the classroom time. Um, and all that, the community college pieces and, and the plan for the four year will all be in place by fall when we, when we kick this off. Um, so behavioral health tech, it's that, that population. I think peer counselor pretty much speaks for itself. Uh, one of the questions people might have is what about the certified peer counselor certificate, the 40 hour certificate? Um, this, 
right now, we actually just had a meeting yesterday with um, a healthcare authority to talk about that and figuring out a structure because of all the backups around that. Um, and so we are working with them to figure out a plan. Um, but right now it looks like it will be a prerequisite that they have their CPC done to join the apprenticeship program and, and get engaged for the peer counselor. We are coming up with plans on how we can support making that happen for people who are interested. So we are looking, we are working with the healthcare authority to find ways where we can run classes and or we market this directly to people who are already have their CPC and are interested in getting into an apprenticeship program. So that might be a question that people have around the peer counselor. The substance use disorder professional is um, the occupation that has gotten the most, I'll just say press, I guess I'll say that because there was a lot to do in order to make this happen because previous to this, it was not legally, it wasn't, we could not offer, uh, people could not get certified if they used an apprenticeship program as their way to get their education. Uh, as soon as we started this work, we realized what would need to happen. And we actually work with the legislature and got the law changed. So that law has now changed. So you can use apprenticeship as a way to um, get certified as a substance use disorder professional, uh, which is super exciting. And so we are uh, moving forward with that. Now, this is a two-year program. It's definitely a far more intense program than the other two in terms of the content that's covered uh, for obvious reasons. And they will be certified when they, in order to complete the program, they have to get their national certification. So that certification will be happening at the end of the program as well. Okay, other questions about these three occupational pathways? Laurie, you have a couple of questions in the chat or rather oh, a comment from Mark. Okay. Um, he said, the SUDP trainees currently often start while they're in school. Would be good to hear employers' experiences with these students' productivity. Okay, let me, let me, uh, sorry, I just pulled up my chat and I'm just looking here to see where that's at so I can read. That's not a question for you, Laura, as much as it is for longer range hearing back from the employers. So I, so I had a hard time hearing the, hearing the comment, Mark. Can you say it? Uh, sure. You state it. My oh. question was not for you, Laura, it was more wanting to hear, being open to wanting to hear some information back from employers. Okay. Um, oh, so you, you are asking, SUDP trainees currently often start while they're in school, would be good to hear about employers' experiences with students' productivity. Yeah, that is that would be an interesting piece to do a comparison with. Okay, and Sarah, you asked a great question about SUDPTs. So yes, um, they will be starting out. It is a requirement that they will be getting their SUDPT uh, until they uh, get all the way until they complete. So thank you, thank you for that clarification. They will start out um, by getting their SUDPT. The language that we have in the standards is that they will either have that at the beginning unless the employer allows them to have some time to get it once they start. So we have a little bit of flexibility in there, but they will uh, immediately upon starting the apprenticeship program, either prior or immediately upon joining, they will be working to get their SUDPT. Great questions. Thank you. And I, I don't know if you wanna take a minute, I can give my thoughts to, uh, to the question about productivity of SUDPTs, sure. if that that's would be great. appropriate. I would just say, you know, um, yeah, from the perspective of employing SUDP T's and P's, there's a big difference with the T's, whether they're in their first 50 hours or not in terms of their ability to be productive. So that's the big delineation is, you know, your first 50 hours of client care when you're a T, you have to be physically in the room with a P. So you really kind of can't have your own productivity. Um, you know, so it's a much bigger lift when you hire the, the, baby T's, no offense, <laughs> you know, this is like the big T and then the P. Um, so I just, you know, wanted to comment on that, that I think once they're past that 50 hours, they can, they're just as productive, generally speaking, as a P. Um, so that first 50 hours, that's, that's a bigger lift for the organization. That's great, Sarah. Thank you for that. Any other questions or comments about all this? All right, uh, so one of the questions people, uh, actually, James, will you switch the slides? 
So one of the questions people might have is how do you get started? And what about recruitment? How do we get people in? All that kind of good stuff. So let me talk about that a little bit. So let, um, I'm gonna start by talking about recruitment of apprentices into the program. So one of the, of course, one of the major um, positives about participating in the apprenticeship program is that we will be able to support you in identifying candidates interested in, in getting in. And there will be people who are interested um, because of the model and you will have access to a greater diversity, presumably um, greater diversity from what you might already have access to today. So how that works is there's a, every employer situation is different. Again, this is one of the beautiful things about apprenticeship is its flexibility. Every, an employer could come to us and we have this all the time. Employer comes and says, hey, we wanna actually hire from within. We wanna take somebody who's already working at our facility in a lower level position. They're interested in advancing. We wanna put them in the apprenticeship program. Great, more power to you, let's do it. Um, and by the way, the employer has full ability to hire whoever they wanna hire into the apprenticeship program. So you all get to do that. However, however your standard processes normally work. Um, now, the distinction I think would be is if you're in a union shop and the union was involved in the apprenticeship program, then they will most likely want to contract with you around or negotiate with you around the apprenticeship program. Um, so we stay out of that mix. That's just, that would be, uh, just know that, that if you're a union shop, there might be conversations that need to take place around whatever that looks like. But we, as the apprenticeship program, have nothing to do with hiring or firing. Um, it's all just the standard processes that an employer goes through. So you might say, hey, I've got my own folks, or you might say, hey, can we get some assistance? And so what we have done historically is we partner with local community-based organizations to identify candidates who are interested, and we actually can help kind of funnel people um, uh, to you to help you know, bring people to your door. I see here that we actually have somebody, I don't even know Terry, but I see Terry, Terry, I saw that you're with the high schools. There's, there's also a possibility that we can do work with, um, folks who are coming out of high schools as well. So that's a possibility. But historically, we've been doing things with community-based organizations. In Seattle, we have a really great system, um, but we also are um, have outreach that we're doing, we're going to be doing more of. We just now, in the stages of where we're at, we haven't started this apprentice recruitment piece. We're just now starting to kind of formulate what all that's going to look like across the state. And I will say that I think I did see Catherine here is she still here? Catherine from the um, Washington State Community Health. Uh, I don't know if she's still here or not, but um, we have a contract with them as well. And they are, um, they have somebody who is going to be um, helping us to recruit in the more rural areas because we really want to be able to support not just urban, but certainly the rural communities. And so we have, we have a contract with them. Uh, they have somebody on staff whose job will be to help us connect with some of those community-based organizations that are connected to their communities of health. Um, and we can partner with them to help get apprentices identified or candidates identified and provide them to uh, lists of people to employers to interview or however, the, however they want to do that. So in terms of the timeline, um, we are, when you look at this schedule that we have up here on the screen, know that all the classes are scheduled to start around the fall timeframe. So this is all kind of backing up from there. If we, but this, this timeline is based on the general concept of, if we were to just start one, when would that be? Uh, how long would it take to get one going? So you can see that we generally need at least, if you wanted to run your own full cohort, we would need up at least three months to do that. Um, but this is conceptually the steps that we go through when we're working with an employer. So in that, two, that three month to two month range, we're working on having you all sign the official Washington State Registered Apprenticeship uh, Training Agent Agreements. If you sign up, you're considered in Washington State a training agent. That's what you're called. So you sign this agreement and basically saying that you will uh, uh, not discriminate on people in the apprenticeship system and that you uh, are committed to the apprenticeship program. And it's a very simple, easy uh, document and the EEO form as well, saying that you won't discriminate as there. Um, and then we start working with you on, okay, well, where, how many apprentices, where, where are you interested in those apprentices being? Because some of the places we work with have clinics in multiple locations. Are you planning on rotating them during the course of their apprenticeship? Are you keeping them in one place? So there's, there's a lot of different pieces that have to be kind of sorted out around that. 
And we also have some um, documents for you around the on the job training plan that we want to help work through with you to make sure that you ha you're thinking about that and you have some sort of way to uh, have a structured on the job training plan. So you may already have one. That's great if you do. And if you don't, we can we have supports that we can help do that, uh, help support you with. And then around that two month to one and a half month time, we're really starting now to zero in on recruiting apprentices, making sure that your mentors are trained, um, making sure that you know you have you're getting your interviews done and and getting everything kind of finalized and ready. And then two weeks before is when we start. We do onboarding. Um, we start enrollment with the apprentices. We actually have to get them all registered in Washington State through the apprenticeship system. Um, so we start all that whole process. Any other regulatory agency processes that we need to go through, we make sure that we're done. And then uh, the program launch. So. How, in terms of the structure, just so you know, I talked about on the job training and I talked about RSI, what does, or, or the classroom time. In general, this is not what it always looks like, but in general, how ours have mapped out is that they um, generally, they go to school full time every day for one, two, three weeks, depending on the program, what's needed to make sure that they know basic safety, they know HIPAA, they know all those things that they have to know before you actually have them on a floor. We get them trained, we get that initial piece under their belt, then they start work and usually they're working Monday through Thursday and then on Friday they're going to school and that's the, that's the basic structure. So it's a pretty simple system and they're doing that for the duration of the year. Okay, any questions about any of that so far? It's a lot of information. I hope you're getting a lot of lunch eaten. Hi, Susie. <laughs> Sorry. No, no so, don't apologize. So would that be that they're essentially on campus 32 hours a week? Yes. In in program learning, practicing, and yes. then all day Friday in school. Great. Yes. For, yes. for a year for the text. Yes, for the text they're in, yes, for a year. That's correct. Any other questions? Okay. So you'll also notice down here that we have employer support. So this is one of the super exciting pieces about this project. Every time I've run apprenticeship programs, uh, this is shockingly, um, we have had amazing support for um, helping employers get engaged in this apprenticeship program. So we do have funding that we can uh, work with each employer on to support. And it's essentially, we have a little bit of funding that you would get for helping, you know, getting your initial forms filled out and all that kind of stuff. But majority of the funding is per apprentice. So it covers things like, for example, uh, we are, uh, one of the best practices in apprenticeship is that the uh, person who, the apprentice is actually getting paid during the time that they're on school during that Friday day. These employer incentives will cover the wages up to a certain amount in general, what we expect to be the basic wages. So there may be, if you're, pay is really high, maybe it won't cover the whole amount, but it will certainly cover a substantial amount of their pay during the time that they normally would be going to school on those Fridays or at that front end. Uh, so we have funding built in for that. We also have funding built in for uh, helping to pay a often called a differential for the mentor to actually give them I think the amount we have built in for this is a dollar an hour more increase on their wage if they choose to be a mentor during the time that they are a mentor. So we have funding for that. We have a few more little pieces in there um, that in a whole system, which if you're interested in this program, we can get into the weeds on how that funding will be allocated and whatnot. But it is a considerable amount of funding uh, for each apprentice that you bring on. And Ian, I want to make sure and call out Ian there. He's waving in the corner. Well, he's in the corner on my screen. Um, he is our employer engagement um, uh, staff person. And so he is the one who would be actually going out and meeting with each of you and getting into the weeds on all these different pieces. I, um, the other people you really need to know is of course, Mark, I mentioned Mark Buffet. He is our director of apprenticeship and myself. And between the three of us, we will make sure to get you whatever supports you need to, um, to get started. Any questions so far? Any other questions? Okay, James, you wanna change the page? So 
at the end of the day, here's what you need to know. Anyone can participate, employer or apprentice. We can make it, you know, as, as long as they can meet the basic requirements of being able to go to work, uh, make available, they can get their transportation there and they meet the very minimum requirements of being in an apprenticeship program and any employer in, in Washington state can participate. <clears throat> um, even if, so even if we didn't have employer incentive fundings, so if we were outside of that ballpark, we the cost for our program is actually really reasonable. But right now there is no cost because we have these employer incentive funds. So we have the opportunity, we have 60 behavioral health technician positions that are funded, 60 peer counselor positions that are funded, and 40 substance use disorder positions that are funded. So we have funding employer incentive funds for, for a total of 160 apprentices uh, in all, you know, combined in these different occupations. So we have that much employer incentive funding to, um, to get going. And of course, the benefits, can't overstate the equity element here, helping you bring more people to the door uh, to get in and hopefully continue on in their field. Um, and our goal is that this apprenticeship would align with your strategic goals as an organization. Betsy said, would this funding cover the apprentice's salary? So no, this only, it only covers the salary of them during the day that they're doing their related supplemental instruction. So not their, the employer still needs to pay for their wage. Thank you for clarifying that, Betsy their basic wage still has to be covered. Let's see. Uh, any other questions? I'm pulling up chat here just to see if there's anything in chat. Uh, contact information for the employer people. Yes, Ian, will you put your information into the contact please? That would be great. And I, it's on one of the- I will again, absolutely, you bet. Happy to. It's on one of the upcoming slides as well. So I'll switch gears. Actually, can you switch to the next slide, James? Okay, so there's the contact information. And uh, CNI, I see you had a question. Yes, we have a summary of all the skills and competencies for, for behavioral health tech. Um, I can't I put it up on my screen right now, but Ian can easily email that to you. But I also want you to uh, visit our website. So, oh, but it's a link. I see that. We don't have it spelled out down there. Ian, can you put the um, website into chat as well? Absolutely. So that people can click on it. Uh, so if you go to the website, you'll see a whole bunch, much more greater detail about each of the occupations. Um, and I believe, is uh, Ian, can you remind me, are the competencies, the full list of competencies on there or not? Uh, no, not to my knowledge. Mm -mm. So we um, we are happy to get anybody the full list of competencies because we have all those, obviously. At yeah, our just fingers. send me an email. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. So reach out to Ian and he'll get you the list of competencies. Okay, another question. Oh, actually, this isn't a question Mark was putting in there. Um, so long term in terms of the apprenticeship program uh, and even short term, but we have discovered that um, with a lot of our apprenticeship programs, folks who are coming in who, uh, if they're in a, uh, their financial situation is such that they might qualify for some federal funding, often referred to as WIOA funding. Um, and that federal funding essentially is attached to that individual to help support them while they're getting going. And that um, is one of the long-term ways that we can help make this sustainable for employers. Even though our cost is really not that expensive, they can also access this WIOA funding to help even lower the cost even more. Again, that isn't as necessary right now that we have grant funding, but um, it will, you know, ultimately our goal is that we can use that WIOA funding to even bring down our, our uh, regular rate. Okay, there's a couple more things in the chat. Let me see here. Um, Monica said, can you clarify how Healthcare Apprenticeship Consortium is tied or different from WATCH? Um, so this is for somebody who's new trying to understand. Absolutely. Um, well, I know Alyssa's here. I saw Alyssa I, that you um, put something in chat that you're here and she's from WATCH so she can speak to WATCH. But 
Um, we are partnering with Watch on this project in terms of we have a contract with them. They're helping us actually do recruitment out in the field for these behavioral health occupations. So they are a partner of ours in this work. Um, Alyssa, do you have anything else you want to add? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Monica, uh, we have a staff person on board, Prudence Medina. Um, she's our behavioral health professions coordinator. She's been talking to all of the behavioral health directors at the community health centers that we represent. Um, so I know for ICHS, you know, she's been talking um, to someone there at your organization, and we could certainly get in contact with you to let you know who she's been talking to. Um, but we're bringing this information to the community health centers on behalf of the Healthcare Apprenticeship Consortium. So same program that we're talking about when we talk to you guys, um, just to help broaden the reach of this program so that you know all healthcare facilities can participate. Um, we're big fans of, uh, of the Washington Association of Community Health. They do amazing work and we uh, love that, that we have this opportunity to partner with them on, on this particular effort. So super excited about being able to have this partnership with them on, on these behavioral health occupations. Okay. Um, I'm looking to see if there's more. I don't think I see any other questions in chat. Does anybody have anything else? James, I think our timing is pretty perfect. You did a fantastic job. How about a virtual round of applause to SEIU and Laura Hopkins and all her team. Thank you. Thank you. That was fantastic, fantastic information. And I'm so impressed with all the progress. Uh, and you know, to, to, from, from conception to actually implementation, you were talking about three months. Wow, that's a, that's a lot of work to get done in three months for, for just this kind of work. So thank you, uh, Laura and SEIU for all that terrific information. Uh, if you have any more uh, questions, you do see the contact information listed above. They did also share it in the group chat. So go ahead and take a copy of that if you get time just in the next few minutes. Uh, but we are really appreciative. Um, we are coming to a close, so thank you very much for joining. Just a few different announcements uh, as we end this session. Uh, just remember that Thursdays are now HILT days uh, for the Lunch and Learn. Today is a Tuesday, but our natural, our regular HILT meetings are all on Thursdays. This includes the Information Exchange, the Talent Pipeline Committee, the quarterly meetings, and the support partner check-ins. Uh, also remember that all meetings are now require a registration just the same way that you did here and you can register at cKingHilt.com. And just uh, to reiterate some of our upcoming events that are coming up uh, on April 25th through the 29th we have sound careers in healthcare week big big week it's going to be a fantastic event if you have any questions or would like to participate, please do not hesitate to give me an email. Um, also, on May 12th, we have the Talent Pipeline Committee. On May 17th, we have another Lunch and Learn that is happening, and that is on Cultural Humility Scenario Workshop. Lots of good information coming there. And then we have two more uh, for the second quarter of the year. May 26th is our spring quarterly meeting. And of course, June 16th, once again, we'll have our support, support partner check-in. Uh, thank you very much to everyone. Thank you for all of your effort, and we wish you a very good week. And we will see you later. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne.